Good morning, my name's Andy. I'm the pastor of Legacy South, and I'm privileged to be bringing you the message as we continue spending time in Luke's diner. We've been looking at the people uh, in the Gospel of Luke this Lenten season. We've been looking at John the Baptist who prepared the way, the disciples, the 12 inner circle, and the 72 that were all sent. And last week we looked at the women who had such an impact on Jesus' ministry. Well, today we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to begin to look at the enemies of Jesus, those who were opposed to him. And that was the religious leaders of the day. We're going to spend some time at the end of Luke 19 and into chapter 20. So let's dive right in. Luke 19 at the end gives us a great view of why the religious leaders felt the way they did about Jesus. I mean, they should have known before anybody that he was the Messiah. They knew the promises that were made, but they missed it. And it gives us a really good picture when Jesus clears the temple. What was going on there was in Jerusalem, to start with, you need to understand how crowded Jerusalem was. Sometimes we picture a sleepy little town. It was anything but a sleepy little town. Picture Las Vegas and that would have been a better image of what was going on during Passover in Jerusalem. A town of 200,000 plus people uh, blown up 10 times, over 2 million people in town, crowds everywhere. And all these travelers, or the majority of these travelers, wanted to come worship at the temple. And the religious leaders knew that, and they took advantage. They would have booths set up, and there was two booths that they would set up to help people with their worship. They were really helping because they would have a temple tax that they would have to pay. And it was equal to about two days' wages for people to be able to pay their temple tax to be able to worship. But they had to do it with the currency of the temple. It was the temple shekel, and people didn't have those. And so they set up an exchange booth that would take their foreign currency and exchange it for the temple shekel that they could pay their tax with. And they would charge them 25% to do this. And then if they had a bigger coin or something that needed change, they would charge an additional 25% just to make change. So they were making huge amounts of money and profiting off of these people with the exchange of their currency. The other booth that they had was the booth with the animals for worship, to be able to uh, bring a sacrifice to the temple. Now, people could bring their own animal, or they could buy an animal out on the street, but in the temple were animals that had been inspected by the high priests, by the religious leaders, to be able to be sure and certified that they were suitable for worship. They would have oxen and sheep and doves. And a dove purchased at the high temple would cost about 15 denarii. And we don't know what that means, but to put that in relation to what it was, if you've ever been to a pro sporting event and, and bought one of those $8 hot dogs or you know a $15 meal at a concession stand, that's what was happening here in the temple. You could, on the street outside the temple, buy a dove for one denarii, and they were charging 15 denarii for a dove. But if someone would bring in a dove from the outside or an animal from the outside that they had brought or bought, the priests would have to look at it. The religious leaders would look at it and inspect it. And they would find a blemish often and be able to tell the people, this is not going to be suitable for temple worship. So they would take that animal and then sell them one of the approved animals and allow them to worship. And then the existing animal that they had brought would somehow miraculously become suitable as it made its way back in to be sold to someone later. Basically what was happening, people were coming to worship God. They had a heart for the Lord. They were excited to be able to come and worship. And the religious leaders of the day were taking that and turning it into a business, a crooked business to line their own pockets. They were taking advantage of ripping off the people coming to worship God. And Jesus was having none of it. In 
verse 45, that's when Jesus says, no, this is not what's going to happen. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Now, after this, Jesus continued teaching and uh, every day in the temple he was teaching and he taught like no one else. So these two camps were created. The people following Jesus, the people listening to what he was saying and the message he was giving, uh, they, were in, they were in the presence of the Messiah. They knew something special was going on. But then the religious leaders were caught up with their greed. They couldn't hear the message. They were concerned about what they were going to lose. They had been given all the authority from the Roman government to handle the temple business and to handle worship there in Jerusalem. And they were concerned about what they were going to lose. They were going to lose money, status, authority, power. All of this that was happening to them is all they could see. And in verse 47, it goes on with where they were. They had decided they needed to destroy Jesus. It says, and he was teaching daily. He's teaching the people in the temple, but the priests don't hear it. Listen, the chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him. This is where we find things as we move into chapter 20. And chapter 20 has been called the, the chapter of questions because it's these interactions between Jesus and the religious leaders to be able to uh, have the religious leaders coming at Jesus with trick questions, with scenarios to try to trap him, to try to get him to slip up, to try to drive a wedge between him and the people that are beginning to follow him, beginning to believe that he is the Messiah. So that's what chapter 20 is all about. And right at the start, the the religious leaders come to him and they talk to Jesus about the authority that he has to be doing what he's doing. Chapter 20, verse 1. One day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, tell us by what authority you do these things or who it is that gave you this authority. So this is the first run of the religious leaders at Jesus. They're questioning his authority and who gave you this authority. And what they were looking for was for Jesus to say God. Because that would have been Jesus automatically being blasphemous. They would have been able to arrest him on the spot and stone him. And that's what they wanted. They wanted Jesus dead. Because he was going to take away from them all the money, all the power, everything they had. But Jesus answers them in a way they don't expect. He answered them, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Now, Jesus isn't being evasive here. He's being a good rabbi. Rabbis would often teach by asking questions. They would be given a question and they would return it with a question to really get people thinking, to be able to dig into what really is the truth. So this is a practice that happened common in this time. But Jesus gives them this question. They had asked him a question that was a catch-22. There was no way for him to really come out of that well, but he turns it right back around on them with a question that they are going to be caught with because the religious leaders of the day did not recognize John the Baptist as a prophet. But the crowd all did. So they were in a spot. The crowd believed John was a prophet, and so this is where they find themselves. Verse 5, And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from, and Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. 
So if you've ever watched the game show Family Feud, this was a Family Feud moment for the religious leaders. Jesus gives them this question, and they huddled together to come up with what the answer would be. They wanted to say that it was from man. They didn't recognize John, but they couldn't because they knew what would happen to him because of the crowd. So they had to answer, I don't know. They continued to drop down in the eyes of the crowd, and Jesus continued to elevate in the eyes of the people because they were, once again, trapped. They had tried to trap Jesus, but he turned it right back around on them. So the rest of this chapter is similar encounters. Jesus tells a parable that really upsets the religious leaders, and then he proceeds to answer questions by them, all trying to trap him. Do we pay taxes to Caesar? Um, What about the resurrection? And Jesus answers all of them incredibly wisely and without letting the religious leaders have any ammunition, any foothold to be able to attack him. Not because he was afraid of being attacked, but because his time had not yet come. He knew the timing God had for what he was there to do. And that was coming in just a couple of days in the garden, but it wasn't there yet. So one of the things that Jesus did on this as you go through this chapter at the very end is he continued to go back and forth with the religious leaders in this conflict that they had. But then he warns his disciples at the very end. And this is very telling of where the religious leaders and Jesus relationship was. Verse 45. And in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, all the people could hear this as he talks to his disciples, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. These Pharisees, these religious leaders, these scribes, these high priests were not godly men. They should have recognized Jesus as the Messiah, the chosen one, the king of kings. But they couldn't because they were blinded by their own wants, their own desires, their own greed. So from this, I have two questions for us. Are we sometimes like these religious leaders? Now, I'm not saying that we take advantage of widows' houses or or prey on the underprivileged or that we're crooked. That's not what I'm saying. But do we sometimes have what I would call Pharisee tendencies? In my own life, I know where it usually shows up would be in two ways. One would be pride. Pride and arrogance. Sometimes I'll put myself up above my fellow man. And that's exactly what these religious leaders did. And that's not what we're called to do. Do we ever put ourselves up above someone else? Maybe we're more blessed than someone else. Maybe we have more than someone else materially. But no one is better than anyone else. We are all created in the image of God. We all are valued by God. And we all need to treat each other equally. That's something that's critically important. The other one I would ask is, what's the authority in our lives? Sometimes it's just like these religious leaders. It's career, it's money, maybe it's family. There's all sorts of things that can be the authority in our lives, but it's supposed to be God. If God's the authority in our lives, it shows If God's the authority in our lives, it shows. Our attitudes show it. Our conversations show it. Our decisions reflect it. That's the type of people we are called to be. I've got some habits for you, three habits to give you to kind of help us along this path. And they're simple, they've been heard before, but they're important. The first habit I would say would be living with an attitude of gratitude, living a life of praise, recognizing that we all deserve that cross of Calvary. We all deserve death because we're sinners. And Jesus said, no, I am going to take that for you. 
And because he did what he did, we are saved. We should be so thankful for that every single day. And that should reflect in our lives and how we treat other people. The second habit, I would say, is time in the Word of God. Daily time in the Word of God. I don't care if it's one verse every day. Pick a verse a week, read it every day, commit that to memory, and that is going to change who has or what has the authority in your life. Scripture in our lives impacts the way we live. That's the truth. Being in God's Word daily is required. If all you're being fed is this Sunday morning message, my friends, it's not enough. We need to be in the Word every day. The third one is our prayer life. Daily communication with God. He's waiting right there for us to come to Him every single day. We need to take the time to be in communication with our Father. That helps us on that path. These three habits, practiced daily in our lives, will show results. And the results I'm talking about are not necessarily uh, huge things that everybody will see. I'm not saying we're going to be preaching the gospel and praying for people on street corners. I'm not saying we're not. But it will show up in the small details of the way we live our lives. It will show who has authority in our lives. I'll give you an example. My family, whenever we can, like to go out to eat on Sunday afternoon after church. And so the the boys and Joanne and I all went out recently, and we went and had a nice meal. And we all had iced teas or sodas to drink. And the waiter brought our bill, and he hadn't rang up the drinks. So I called him over. I said, you didn't ring up the drinks. You forgot to ring the drinks. And he said, oh, no. He says, I'm going to hook you up, and you hook me up. And I automatically was just put off. I said, no, we can't do that. I said, I am not okay stealing. You need to ring these drinks up and do it now, please. And he got a little flustered. He went and rang up the drinks and brought our bill back and we paid and tipped and we left. And that might not sound like a big deal at all, but you know what? In that moment, you know who saw that? Is my boys. We got in a conversation about Dad, we, we had free drinks. I'm like, no, that's not how we do things. Because God's the authority in our life, these are the decisions we make. That's how it will start to show up in your life. The teaching today about religious leaders boils down to a question. What's authoritative in our lives? If the answer is not God, it opens up another question. What is? Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for this teaching from the Gospel of Luke, Lord. As you faced these religious leaders, these enemies, Lord, you were so wise. I pray that you will give us the same wisdom as we face challenges in this world. Lord, may we be a people who seek your guidance in our conversations, in our relationships, in our decisions, Lord, may we be a people that submit ourselves to your authority. For no other reason than it is good for us. You have a plan for our good, Lord, and we can trust in that plan. I pray that you will help us to grow in our faith, grow in our trust, to become passionate followers of you. I pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.